Next one, number eight. A city street is. I'll go right to the answer and then let's back up to here. It says C is the answer to number eight. It says a common resource is, is when it's congested, but it's a public good when it's not congested. So a city street, if there's traffic, if people are on it, then it's congested and means it's rival, but it's not excludable, so it fits into C. But if there's no congestion and you getting on that road bothers nobody, doesn't compete with anybody, not excludable, then it becomes a public good. Not rival, not excludable. Okay? So the answer to number nine is, is excuse me, number eight is C. And let's go to number nine. All right. On hot summer days, electricity generating capacity is sometimes stretched to the limit. At these times, electric companies may ask people to voluntarily cut back on the use of electricity. An economist would suggest. All right. It's 99 degrees out. Everybody's sweating in the city. Con Ed comes out and says, we want everybody to voluntarily kind of reduce electricity. You go, right, I'll let someone else do it. I'm boiling in this apartment of mine. I'm not going to cut back. That's a classic example of a kind of common resource, which is rival in consumption. Because they're telling you, we haven't got the capacity to basically keep everybody at 65 degrees when it's 100 degrees outside. All right. So it's rival in consumption, but it's not excludable. I, electricity is going out all over the grid, all right? And so I can't really exclude anybody, but the consumption is going to hurt us. So what's the answer? Again, in this particular case, economists say charge. You want to run your air conditioner, you know, at the heat of the day, when it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's 105 degrees, you're going to have to pay a lot of extra money to do that. And if you did that, people would cut down. They'd figure other ways out to stay cool. They'd go to the beach, they'd go to a pool, they'd stay in the shade, whatever. But they wouldn't use their scarce money on electricity that was costing a fortune during that time. And maybe, again, be much. they would be less likely to go out and go shopping and leave the AC on, for example. People would be much more conservative. So the economists always say, let price ration the particular good, all right? And we'll get a much more efficient use of it. Those who really need it, who are doing business, who are doing work, et cetera, they're willing to pay for that extra amount of money because their livelihood depends on it. Those for whom, you know, take it or leave it, but I'll just leave it on so it's convenient when I come back in the house, the house is cold. No, that person's probably going to pay back on their use of electricity, which is just what you want to have happen because they don't really value it as much as some of the others. All right? So... The answer would be, as I, hopefully that, that explains it, would be B. Number nine is B. It would be more efficient if the electric company raised the rates of electricity at peak times. Again, congestion pricing, peak pricing. It's a very efficient way to manage our resources, not to overconsume, and have those who value that resource the most be willing to pay the most for it. Okay? All right. Number 10, last one. Markets fail to allocate resources efficiently when? So when, do, when does like the market break down, right? And the example, the, the example here of number 10 is C, property rights are not well established. So we talked about a little bit about it in class and your book gives you an example. Right now they're over consuming elephants. They're killing elephants for their tusks, okay? And it's becoming a, a, such a serious problem because poachers come on to the national parks in Africa, they shoot the elephants, they cut out the tusks, and these huge, beautiful animals are just left to rot because no one else, the only thing they want is their tusks. And the answer is, how come elephants are becoming scarce, but cattle are plentiful? That might sound like a stupid question, but it isn't. It's because the cattle have an owner. That owner has a very powerful incentive to manage their cattle carefully. So they want to make sure that they breed well, that they're healthy, that they basically produce calves to keep the cycle going. And when people have property rights, they protect that property because the incentives are so obvious. It's their livelihood. They make money from it. When there are no property rights, when it's a common resource to go in there and just grab the elephants because no one else owns it, you don't own it, you're going to take what you want from it and not use what you don't want from it. So uh, the destroying of the elephants or other kinds of you know, wild animals, tigers are going to be an extinction, etc. Part of it is the encroachment of population centers on these areas, but other part of it is People will kill them for reasons, monetary reasons, of course, um, and there's no one who has the, the incentive to protect them from these poachers in this particular sense. So the answer to number 10 is C, if I haven't made it clear. When property rights are not well established, then people overconsume those resources. I'll just give you one more example. The lobsters in the ocean. So what they've done in Australia, for example, is they assign medallions like we do for taxi cabs. 
and allows each fisherman to have a catch of, let's say, 100 pounds a week or something, all right? That fisherman, that's all that can be caught, is what these medallions says it's available to it. Like we have in New York, we have medallions for taxis. You can't drive a cab unless you have a medallion. We fix the supply of medallions. Well, let's say we fix the supply of lobster catches. And then I'm a lobster man, and I kind of like get tired of this business, don't want to do it anymore. I would just sell my medallion to, to hunt, you know, to fish for lobsters to some other fisherman who thought they could do very well with it or they could sell it to other restaurants, whatever it is. But you limit how much should be consumed and there's a price to get into that market for only those who value that good. That access to lobster fishes, fisheries uh, would basically be willing to pay it. So uh, there are solutions and economists can think about them a lot, but they all begin with kind of property rights. Who has the right to consume this? What happens in New Zealand is that these fishermen get together to make sure that they manage how big the medallions are, how big the catch should be in order to preserve each year enough lobsters to go out there and to have all of them be in business. So they learn to manage it themselves because they have the property rights over this particular area and they share it. All right, that's the end of chapter 11. Again, I think it's a really important chapter for our basic public policy and our concerns about our resources, about our oceans, about our traffic. Lots of great lessons, lots of great examples. Uh, hopefully this quiz made some sense. I'll see you in class.